Hello, this is Chef John from foodwishes.com with fried peach and pancetta pizza. That's right, we're doing fried pizza, which I was gonna call fritza, but then I was afraid people would think that meant fruit pizza, and there would have been massive confusion, so we're not gonna do that. And believe it or not, this was inspired by a childhood dessert, because my family used to take leftover pizza dough scraps, and they'd fry it and toss it in sugar to make like a quick donut-like treat. But here, we're gonna take that same idea and turn it into a savory application. So I'm gonna go ahead and get started by cooking some pancetta. So in a cold skillet, I have a big handful of some thickly sliced pancetta, and I am gonna add a little drizzle of olive oil to get things started. And we'll go ahead and put that on medium heat, and cook it until we have something very nicely caramelized. And all pancetta is is a cured pork. They call it Italian bacon, but it isn't smoked, so the flavor is not really bacon-like, but just absolutely delicious nonetheless. And like I said, we're gonna cook that until it's fairly well caramelized. So here we're starting to get there. So I let this go a couple more minutes until I had something that resembled this. And at that point, all I want you to do is turn off the heat and let that cool right in the pan. Because when we use this to top our pizzas, we do want a little bit of that oil coming along for the ride, okay? So we'll turn off the heat, we'll leave that right there, and we'll move on to the pizza dough. So yes, you're gonna need some prepared pizza dough. And I'm gonna cut that in quarters because I'm gonna make little small pizzas. And we'll take one of those pieces and we'll dust it with flour. And as with anything like this, we just wanna use enough flour so we can work with it. Don't put too much flour. All right, don't be afraid of a little stickiness. And then all we wanna do is roll this out and or stretch it with our hands to get it about an eighth of an inch thick. So I kinda use a combination of pulling and stretching and rolling. And please don't be concerned about shape. Really the beauty of this thing is any shape's gonna be perfect, except for a perfect circle. Perfect will look stupid. I mean, that imperfect shape is one of the things that makes us look awesome. Kind of like people. But anyway, like I said, we're gonna roll that out to about an eighth of an inch thick. And when it gets to this point, I kind of like to finish off by just stretching it with my fingertips. There should be just enough stickiness to kind of make it adhere and sort of keep it stretched out like that. So that looks good. And at that point, just let it sit there and rest for about five minutes before we go ahead and fry this in olive oil. So I'm gonna use a heavy cast iron skillet set on medium high heat. And we're just gonna shallow fry this. There's only about a half inch of olive oil in there. And we'll carefully place that dough in. Pro tip, don't burn yourself. Always place it in a way that if it splashes, it splashes away from you. And we're gonna fry that for about two minutes per side or until it's nicely browned and cooked through. And you're gonna see both sides are gonna have a very distinctive look. So I'm gonna flip this over. And the side that went down first is gonna be quite browned around the outside, around the outside, around the outside. But the center's gonna be kind of light. But don't worry, that's where our toppings are gonna go. So that will be the top. And then this other side, as you'll see, is gonna pretty much brown across the whole surface. So that looks good. And like I said, it's gonna take about two minutes per side, give or take. But you'll know, because it'll look like this. And then what we'll do is we'll drain that very well on paper towels. And at that point, your fried pizza dough is ready for toppings. And one cool thing about this is you can do this step ahead, even the day before if you want. And we'll talk about that on the blog. But I'm not doing this ahead, I wanna eat right now. So I'm gonna go ahead and transfer those onto a foil lined baking sheet. Again, we wanna make sure we have that lighter side up, the concave side up, the convex side down, and we will begin to build our pizza. So I'm gonna start by spreading these with some beautiful ricotta cheese. Don't put too much, but make sure you got enough. Okay, I'm recommending the perfect amount here. And then once these have been cheesed, I'm gonna do a little bit of fresh herb. In this case, I'm using fresh thyme leaves. Basil is also fantastic. So if you want something a little bit on the sweeter side, go basil. And if you'd rather have a little more on the savory, herbaceous side, go with the thyme. And not too much, just a hint. And then we'll go ahead and grab our pancetta, which should be now cool enough to handle. And we'll go ahead and scatter that over the top. And again, you don't want too much, but you do want some pancetta in every bite. So make sure you distribute that thoughtfully. And please note, I'm using nice thick slices of pancetta because you really want that nice porky bite here, something to sink your teeth into. And by the way, there's nothing porkier than pancetta. But anyway, that looks pretty good right there. And then when you're cooking, you always wanna to listen to yourself. Because as I was looking at these, I said to myself, you should put a little black pepper on there. So I did. And at that point, it was time for the other main ingredient. Beautiful, fresh, ripe, incredibly sweet peaches. We're gonna take a few slices and nuzzle them in. Actually, I said nuzzle, I actually meant nestle. But now that I think about it, nuzzle works. And I'm kinda of trying to position these where they're covering up the minimum amount of pancetta. So I'm kind of going in between the chunks, but that's not a big deal. It's gonna taste incredible regardless. So I'm gonna go with five nice slices. That's what looks like it works here. But anyway, that's up to you. You are the Mother Teresa of your fried pizza. And then once that stone fruit has been placed down, I'm gonna to top it with a fairly generous grating of Parmigiano Reggiano. And by generous, I mean about 10 to 12 cents worth. And then last but not least, before these go in the oven, I'm gonna give them a little drizzle of extra virgin olive oil. This time we're using the good stuff. 
And then we'll go ahead and pop those in a very hot oven, 475, for about 12 to 15 minutes, or until it looks like this. It should be beautifully browned. All right, you may see a little bit of caramelization happening on the cheese. And those peaches will be perfectly tender. And I'm sorry if it sounds like I'm patting my own butt, but those really do look amazing. I mean, come on, how do you not want to eat that? Although, and you knew this was coming, you really should let those cool for about 5 or 10 minutes. I mean, if you eat this too hot, you just don't get the full effect. So let it cool a little bit. And at that point, go ahead and pop it on a plate. If you have the time and you have the time, you can go ahead and accessorize with a couple extra sprigs. And that fried peach and pancetta pizza is done. And I was going to say something else, but I forgot what that was because I want to eat this. So let me go ahead and cut this in half and dig in to what ended up being one of the most delicious things I've eaten all month. That subtly sweet, rich ricotta, that beautifully caramelized porky pancetta, which always has that little hint of cured funkiness to it. And of course, those sweet peaches and Parmesan and thyme and black pepper and olive oil. Just a magnificent array of flavors. And I want to be clear, there's absolutely nothing wrong with regular pizza. Just like there's nothing wrong with boiled potatoes. But sometimes you want french fries. You know what I'm saying? So I really do hope you give this a try. Head over to foodwishes.com for all the ingredient amounts and more info as usual. And as always, enjoy. Potato chip pizza. That's right. The first time I saw potatoes offered as a pizza topping, I thought that was one of the dumbest things I'd ever seen. But then I tried it. And I realized if done properly, potatoes can be a fantastic pizza topping. The only problem is they're extremely hard to do properly, since they need to get cooked through by the time our crust is done. Which, long story short, led me to try potato chips, which, much to my amazement, worked out astonishingly well. So with that, let's go ahead and get started with our least interesting and exciting step. And that would be rubbing a nice heavy-duty sheet pan with a little bit of olive oil, followed by a light dusting of cornmeal which is our basic pan prep when we're simply going to bake a pizza. And we're not going to be messing around with stones or peels or any other special pizza making equipment. And once that's set, we can move on to shaping our dough. And for this, I'm using exactly one half batch of our Wolfgang Puck pizza dough recipe, which I like to shape into an oval before rolling it out. And as you might know, rolling out pizza dough is very much frowned upon, since they say you're crushing and pressing out all the air bubbles, which is totally true, and I'm not saying it doesn't, but what I am saying, for this pizza, it doesn't matter. Okay, if we were doing something like a pizza margarita, then I would go with a much wetter, much stickier dough and not roll it. So the final product would be more delicate and airy and bubbly, not to mention thin. But when we're talking about a potato pizza, I think the crust needs to be a little more substantial and dense. Which, by the way, is why I chose the Wolfgang Puck recipe, which is my go-to pizza dough when I am going to put a lot of toppings on. So as they say, the right tool for the right job, and for me, rolling out this slightly drier pizza dough really does work best for this application. But regardless, we're going to roll this out to an eighth of an inch thick. And while you can do any shape you want, of course, I'm going to have to insist, for this you roll it out into the shape of a potato. All right, for potato chip pizza, that's the rule. And then once that's been accomplished, we'll go ahead and transfer that onto our pan. And then once that's been positioned, I like to go around giving it a little bit of a finger tipping, which probably really doesn't do too much, but it sure feels good. And at this point, we can go ahead and start layering on our toppings. The first of which would be a generous application of pesto, which hopefully, of course, is homemade. But I'm happy to report the quality of store-bought pesto has been going up lately. And in the spirit of full disclosure, I will admit, today I'll be using my favorite already prepared jar. And the amount we want to put on should be exactly in between not enough and too much. Okay, I want to see some, but not too much crust showing through. And by the way, make sure you have enough to save a couple tablespoons for the top, since we're going to drizzle that over after this has been cheesed and chipped. And speaking of cheese, once our crust has been spread with the pesto, we can scatter over the first of our two cheeses. And for cheese layer number one, I'm using a very sharp white cheddar. And we are not going to put on a ton. And as you can see, I'm going almost, but not quite to the edge, with both the pesto and the cheese. And then once our cheddar's down, we can move on to applying a nice generous layer of chips. And personally, I do recommend using a plain chip, Okay, these were just sea salt flavored kettle chips. And while we do want to be fairly generous, and I'm definitely going to overlap the chips, I found the best results with doing just one layer. Okay, if we pile our chips up too high, it doesn't seem to work out quite as well. But having said that, you go ahead and put on as much as you want. I mean, you are after all the Norman Bates of your crispy carbohydrates. Oh, and if you're lucky, your bag will have lots of these folded over ones. 
which seem to work especially well for this. And what we'll do after we have this covered is maybe take another handful or two and try to tuck them in here and there. So if you see any kind of gaps, go ahead and slip another chip in. And then once that's been accomplished, we will take a couple tablespoons of our pesto and we will thin that out with a little more olive oil, just so it's not quite as thick. It may be a little bit easier to drip over the top, which is our next step. And while we don't want too much, I do like to have a little bit of this thinned out pesto on the top. So we'll go ahead and drip and drizzle that as shown. Oh, and speaking of oil, because we're sort of piling up these toppings pretty high and we went almost all the way to the edge, we are not gonna get much browning on that exposed dough. So if we want to try to get a little more color, we could go around and brush that dough with a little bit of olive oil. But I wasn't overly concerned, so I didn't bother. But I just thought I would throw it out there in case you were looking for one more thing to do. But anyway, once we've dripped over a little more pesto, we'll go ahead and add some raw sliced red onions, which I guess like all pizza toppings are optional. But I think in this case, they really do help tie everything together. So if you're asking me, they are mandatory. And then after the onions, we'll go ahead and apply cheese number two, which would be some grated mozzarella. And please don't use that wet, juicy, fresh stuff. Okay, we just want to use your basic supermarket variety, also known as low moisture. And that's it. We'll go ahead and finish up with a little drizzle of olive oil over the top, at which point we'll head to our preheated 500 degree oven. But we're going to make a pit stop on the way. Since as you might know, when I use a sheet pan for pizza, I like to give the bottom a head start over a high flame for a few seconds, just until I hear it start sizzling, which is going to help our bottom crust brown up nicely. And it's only going to work if you're using a heavy duty sheet pan and not one of those flimsy cookie sheets. And that's it. Once we hear that sizzling, we'll go ahead and transfer that into the center of a 500 degree oven for about 12 to 15 minutes or until our potato chip pizza looks like this. And of course, the exact time is going to depend on how thick your dough was and how much stuff you put on. But at 500 degrees, I'm guessing about 12 minutes should be pretty close. And then I do like to let this rest for about five minutes before I try to cut it, which if you have one, I like to do on one of these cooling racks. And no, I have no idea what that little finger slide was. That was kind of weird. But anyway, rack or not, we'll let that rest about five minutes, at which point we'll transfer it onto a cutting board and we'll find our pizza wheel and portion this up. And if everything's gone according to plan, not only should you have some nice browning on the top, but the bottom of your crust should be nicely browned as well. So yes, contrary to popular belief, you can definitely get a decent texture on your pizza crust, even without using a stone. So that was looking pretty good. But enough show and tell. Let's move on to lift and bite. And that, my friends, if you're a fan of potato top pizzas, is going to be a revelation. Okay, even compared to a perfectly made traditional potato pizza, this, I believe, features a better overall texture, plus an even more intense potato flavor. Not to mention this being like 100 times easier to pull off. Since using the traditional method, you have to slice your potatoes to the perfect thickness so that they're perfectly cooked and tender by the time the crust is done, which is actually very challenging, which is why they're usually sliced very thin. But when they're sliced thin, you don't get a lot of potato, so you don't get a lot of potato flavor. And yes, I've tried thicker slices of potato that have been cooked ahead of time, but it just doesn't give you that same texture as when you do it with the raw potatoes. Whereas this, however, gives you the exact same texture. And by same, I mean even better as these do retain a little bit of crunchiness here and there. So to summarize, this potato chip pizza is no gimmick, but simply in my opinion, a superior way to build a potato pizza. So I could not have been happier with how this came out, other than maybe I wish I had a little bit more color on the edges of the crust. And as I mentioned, you could brush it with oil, which would help a little bit, but probably not too much. You would also have to leave more exposed dough, which I don't like. Okay, I'm not a crust guy. And quite often the birds that live in our yard get to enjoy that later on. But anyway, that's it. What I'm calling potato chip pizza. Now, if you'll excuse me, I'm going to go put some pizza on top of potato chips so as to rebalance the equilibrium of the universe. And while I'm doing that, I really do hope you give this a try soon. So please follow the links below for the ingredient amounts, a printable written recipe, and much more info as usual. And as always, enjoy. Pizza Rustica. That's right, I am very happy to be sharing this traditional Easter recipe, which a lot of people describe as an Italian meat-filled quiche. But to me, it's way closer to a savory cheesecake. So if you've ever been enjoying a slice of that, 
and thought to yourself, I wish this wasn't sweet and also had salami and pepperoni in it, you are going to love this. But no matter how you describe it, it's definitely not like pizza. Although it is pretty rustica and very, very delicious. So with that, let's go ahead and get started with the dough for our crust, which will begin with some all-purpose flour, a little bit of salt, and then some very, very cold butter that we've cut in slices. And as usual, the colder the better. And then we'll also add in a couple tablespoons of olive oil, which as you can see, I'm measuring very carefully. And then what we'll do is take one of these wire pastry cutters, and we'll go ahead and blend that butter into the flour until it resembles coarse crumbs. And by the way, if you don't have one of these tools, you can just use your fingertips to rub all this together, which is how between 90 and 95% of Italian grandmothers would do it. And then what we'll do once our mixture resembles something that looks like this, is stop and make a little well in the center with a fork, into which we'll pour one beaten egg, and then we'll forculate that for about a minute, or until we think that egg is pretty well mixed in, at which point we'll stop and add the last ingredient, a splash of nice cold fresh water, and I should mention, most of the dough recipes for this call for just eggs, but I think a combo of egg water is a little easier to work with. And what we'll do is give that a very brief mixing with the fork before switching to our hands, with which we will attempt to press this into a ball of dough. And if it seems dry and it's not coming together, definitely sprinkle in some more water, like a teaspoon at a time, until it does. In fact, if I'm being completely objective, I think mine was actually a little too dry, and I could have used one more splash. But anyway, it worked. Just barely. But the point is you add enough water so it does come together nicely. And once it does come together, we can transfer that onto the tabletop to finish it off. And then what we'll do once we have manipulated that into a nice disc of dough is go ahead and wrap it in plastic and pop it in the fridge for at least an hour. All right, these type of doughs are always easier to work with once they're cold. Plus it gives our flour time to hydrate. And if you're not filming and in a big hurry, make sure you press those random crumbs I left on the table into your dough. And then what we'll do while our dough is resting in the fridge is go ahead and make our filling, which is going to start with one pound of drained ricotta cheese. And all that means is we left it in a strainer over a bowl the night before so that any of the excess water could drip out. And not to brag, but I was using a really good one, so not much came out. But with your average supermarket variety, you're going to be surprised just how much moisture does leak out. But anyway, we will transfer that to a nice big mixing bowl and add a half a pound of low-moisture mozzarella that we've cut into small cubes. And by low moisture mozzarella, I mean inexpensive. And then the last of our cheese additions will be a couple ounces of finely grated Pecorino Romano. Or if you want some Parmesan, that is up to you. And since this is an Easter video, I think it is appropriate to say, you are after all the Jesus of your cheeses. And either would work. And then to that we will add a little touch of salt, as well as some freshly ground black pepper. At which point we will add seven large beaten eggs. Okay, because six is not enough, and eight would be too many. And then once the eggs are in, it's time to meet our meats. And what I'll be adding is some cooked and crumbled Italian sausage. And I went with the sweet variety, but of course the spicy one would also work. We will also toss in some cubed up smoked ham, as well as some type of cubed up salami. And then last but not least, some pepperoni, which I basically just sliced into strips, since it came already sliced. But if you can find it in stick form, you can go ahead and cube that up just like the salami and the ham. And that's it. We'll go ahead and take a big spoon or a spatula and give this a very, very, very thorough mixing until it's extremely well combined. In fact, if you're not sure, keep stirring until you are. And then stir it for another minute. And that's it. Once that's mixed, we'll go ahead and pop it in the fridge until we're ready to use it. And then the only other thing we need to prep would be a 9-inch springform pan that we've rubbed with olive oil and dusted with flour. And while it is true you can cook this in other large deep baking pans or dishes, this really is what you want to use. So call your friend that does all that baking and safely borrow one from them. And that's it. Once our dough is rested, we can pull it out and unwrap it and cut off about one third for the top. And we'll reserve that while we roll out the rest to fill our pan. And of course, as usual, we will only use enough flour as needed. And we're going to want to try to get this to about an eighth of an inch thick and hopefully about 15 inches wide. And remember when I said I thought my dough was a little dry? Right, you see how it's really splitting around the edges? That is one of the telltale signs. So next time I'll use a little more water. But the good news is because of the way we're going to place this in, that's not really going to matter. But what does matter is this is not sticking to the table. So I made sure that was not a problem before carefully rolling up the dough on my pin like this. 
And we're doing that so it's easier to transfer into our pan. And then what we need to do without stretching the dough out is tuck it into this pan so it's evenly distributed across the bottom and up the sides. And if, like me, you have too much on one side and not enough on the other, you can always pull that extra dough off and dampen it very slightly with some water and then push it into the areas where it's needed. Okay, in a perfect world, you rolled that out uniformly and then placed it in absolutely centered. But you know what? I've never lived in that world. And you probably haven't either. So for people like us, we're going to have to do a little bit of patching. And by a little bit, I mean a lot. And ultimately, what we want to end up with is that dough coming up just past the edge of the pan, which I finally achieved like 10 minutes later. But anyway, once that's accomplished, we'll go ahead and transfer in our filling. And as we do this, we want to make sure there's no air pockets. So make sure you're pressing that firmly into the corners. And once that's been transferred in, we will smooth out the top. And that's it. We will take our remaining dough and roll that out into a circle that's ideally slightly wider than our pan. And then just like the bottom, we'll go ahead and roll that up on our pin and transfer it over the top. Oh, and by the way, in the written recipe, I'm gonna suggest you double the dough recipe so that you have plenty to do this with. Since this amount did work, but I had like absolutely zero to spare, which can make it a little trickier and stressful, especially if you're new to baking. Okay, it's a proven scientific fact that pastries can sense fear and anxiety. But anyway, we'll go ahead and get that top crust properly positioned and pressed in, at which point we will take an egg wash and we'll give this a nice brushing. And if you're not sure what an egg wash is, it is simply one egg beaten with a teaspoon of water. And then once that surface was sufficiently moistened, I decide to take a knife and go ahead and trim off any excess, which is totally optional, but it will give us a little more uniform and cleaner edge. And once that was done, it was time to start folding our dough down from the edge with the crust from the bottom going up over the top of the top crust. And thanks to our egg wash, as we kind of push and press that together, it should seal nicely, at which point it is time to crimp, which can be a little challenging in this situation because our dough is lower than the top of the pan. In fact, I think there was even a song way back when that was called Crimpin' Ain't Easy about this very thing. So all we're really able to do is sort of go around poking, making indentations like this which is fine because once this is baked, it's gonna look great no matter what you did to that edge. And that was actually going pretty well until for some reason I switched directions and proceeded to slice my finger open on the sharp edge of the pan. And at this point I became much less concerned with crimping and much more concerned about not getting blood on the crust. So I stopped and gave the top one last brushing with our egg wash, after which it was ready to transfer into the center of a 450 degree oven for just three seconds because as soon as that's in, we're gonna immediately reduce our heat to 350 and let it bake for about an hour and 15 to 20 minutes or until our top is beautifully golden brown and it looks like this. And then very important, we need to let it sit just like this for 10 minutes before we carefully remove the ring. All right, so don't rush that. It needs to cool down a little bit before we proceed. All right, so let it rest for 10 minutes before you spring the ring. And if everything's gone according to plan, that crust should be a beautiful light golden brown and fully cooked all the way through. And despite the massive amount of patching I had to do, it actually looked pretty good if I do say so myself, which is why I transferred it onto a cake stand, even though I was too chicken to take off the bottom. And I took way too many pictures. But that's okay, because after you de-ring this thing, you definitely want to let it cool for about 15 minutes or so before you slice in. Otherwise, it still might be a little bit loose inside. So like I said, I let mine sit about 15 minutes before cutting out a nice big wedge, which for the first piece taken out of this went surprisingly well. And that, my friends, if you've never seen it before, is what a proper slice of pizza rustica should look like, at least according to me. And if you're wondering what it tastes like, I have some great news. It tastes exactly like what it looks like. Just an absolute embarrassment of riches of Italian meats and cheeses with just enough egg to somehow hold this all together. And of course, I'll state the obvious and tell you you can make this with whatever combination of meat and cheeses you want. Or you can add different cheeses like provolone or fontina, or different meats like copa or prosciutto, or of course, gabagool, as would several other Italian meats I can't pronounce. And I was just about to start telling you how nice and flaky this crust was. But you know what? When it comes to pizza rustica, nobody cares about the crust. It is simply here to hold all this massive amount of goodness together, and that it's fairly light and flaky and tender is just an added bonus. But anyway, that's it. My take on Pizza Rustica. 
which like I said earlier, is nothing like a quiche. So if you're one of these people, please stop describing it like that. Okay, it's way closer to a savory cheesecake containing dangerous quantities of meat. And whether you end up making this for your Easter Sunday celebration or for some other occasion, special or otherwise, I really do hope you give this a try soon. So please follow the links below for the ingredient amounts, a printable written recipe, and much more info as usual. And as always, enjoy. Asparagus, ham, and ricotta pizza. That's right, I'm gonna do what I call a white pizza. We've done these before, I think. This time we're doing an olive oil and ricotta spread as the sauce. The appearance was a little strange, but we'll talk about that later. But all in all, a delicious pizza, and here's how you do it. So we're gonna start with some ricotta cheese, just regular, not skim milk. All right, to that I'm gonna add some minced garlic and some extra virgin olive oil. I'm gonna go ahead and add some red pepper flakes. A little pinch of salt, not too much, because we're going to have some salty ham and cheese on there. Some freshly ground black pepper, and then just a little splash of heavy cream. Of course, if you have some dry herbs or fresh herbs you want to throw in there, go ahead. I was too hungry, to be quite honest. So I didn't put any in, but it certainly would be delicious. And we're going to give that a mix. And if you want this to take a really long time and be super annoying, use a teaspoon. Otherwise, grab a whisk and you'll be done in like two seconds. So anyway, like 10 minutes later, mine was finally mixed and looking pretty good. All right, once our white pizza sauce is done, we're going to set that aside and get ready to build our pizza. All right, I'm using my famous thin crust, no need pizza dough recipe, which you certainly should check out if you haven't. Makes a great pizza. All right, and then I'm going to start spreading on the ricotta mixture. And like any pizza topping, restraint, you don't want a half inch of this stuff, okay? You just want it covered. So this is plenty rich enough. We don't need a ton. So making homemade pizza is a great exercise for many reasons, but that it forces you to have restraint when it comes to pleasuring yourself with food is a big part of it. Once that was spread on nice and thin and evenly, I'm going to top it with some smoked ham. I just gave that a rough dice, more of a rough rectangle, but you get the idea. And again, not too much. I want a little bit in every bite, but don't overdo it. And then uh, some asparagus. Asparagus and ham, beautiful combination. I really like asparagus on pizza, but don't put it on raw. What I did, I threw it in boiling salted water for literally one minute. All right, threw it right into ice water to stop the cooking, drained it thoroughly, and put it on the pizza. Okay, so that asparagus is not cooked through. It's still crisp. It's just not raw. If asparagus is really thin, you can put it on raw. I really like the blanch at first, though. I think you get a better color, a better texture, better everything. All right, so our ham and asparagus is down. I'm going to top that with some sharp white cheddar and a little dusting of Parmesan. All right, we're going to pop that in the oven. I always use the same method. If you don't know what that is, go to the blog post. I'll give you the link. But we always start on the bottom of the oven for five minutes. Then we transfer it to the top of the oven for another five. And there we go. Ten minutes later, I had a beautiful pizza. And by beautiful, I mean not that beautiful. It tasted amazing, but it looked kind of weird. I knew at that temperature... The olive oil and cheese would probably separate, but I thought it would be covered by the cheddar and the Parmesan. So anyway, live and learn. We'll figure it out. But it tasted really amazing. Smoky ham, beautiful fresh asparagus, the sharpness from the cheddar and the Parmesan, and then underneath it all, that beautiful olive oil ricotta base. Just a really nice pizza. And there you go. See? Look at the bottom of that pizza. Our bottom of the oven method is so awesome. You're going to get pizza that looks like that. Pizza stones to me, totally overrated, totally unnecessary. You can get a beautiful crust with a pan. Anyway, appearances notwithstanding, I hope you give that a try. Head over to foodwishes.com for all the ingredient amounts and more info as usual. And as always, enjoy. Sausage and egg pizza. And man, is it delicious. So here we go. We're going to saute some hot Italian sausage. And the reason I saute it, a lot of people put it on raw when they make pizza. I like to render out some of that fat, some of that grease. I don't like greasy pizza. So I'm going to put that on some paper towel and drain it after it cooks. And then I'm going to stretch out about 12 ounces of dough. You can use a store-bought or make your own. There's a recipe on the site. I'm going to put some cornmeal on it. And then I'm going to flip it over cornmeal side down on one of these perforated pizza pans, which I really like because it makes the bottom crispy. Then we're going to put on just enough tomato sauce to cover. Do not put too much sauce, okay? 
We're going to shake on some red pepper flakes, or at least I am, and uh, I think you should too. I like it spicy. I like to kick it up a notch, as uh, uh, Rachel Ray says. I think it's Rachel Ray. One of those TV shows says kick it up a notch. Then we're going to put on some cheese. That's some grated fontina. You can use mozzarella, but fontina is like tastier mozzarella. I'm going to put the sausage on, and I'm going to leave four openings for the egg. Then I'm going to put a little more cheese on top of the sausage. I like how it looks. Put it in a very hot oven for about 10 to 12 minutes. We don't want to cook it all the way, okay, because the egg's got to cook. In the meantime, while that's cooking, you're going to separate your four eggs into little ramekins. That way you can make sure there's no shell. You can make sure they're not broken, which will screw this up. When the pizza comes out, take a back of a spoon or a spatula and just kind of press down into the cheese till you hit the crust, and that will help those eggs sit nice and steady. Now, you want to use fresh, fresh eggs. All right, eggs are very... Uh, perky and sit up nice and high when they're young. When they get older, they kind of sag. Uh, they get a little, uh, you know, they spread out when you when you pour them. So uh, you want to use nice fresh eggs, and they will not run all over the pizza. We're going to put four eggs on there, and then what I think is really nice touch: some fresh ground black pepper right on the yolk. So you're going to grind some of that on there. Now to finish this off, we are going to take some parmesan. And we're just going to give the whole pizza a nice light dusting. Uh, and that's one reason we don't need to salt these eggs, because that Parmesan is obviously has a little bit of salt in it. So you're going to put a nice, uh, you know, sprinkling of fresh Parmesan over. And then it's going to go back in the oven. I'm going to guess that this is going to go about five minutes. Now here's where you got to, you know, open the oven door and check once in a while. See, that's too loose. The white's not done yet. Man, that's a great shot. Sorry, that was immodest. Um, anyway, after about five minutes, the white is set and the yolks are still runny. And that's the perfect condition to take out the pizza. I'm going to top with a little bit of arugula tossed with some olive oil. That is a magnificent pizza. It's unbelievably delicious. You have to try this uh, egg on pizza. I know, it sounds crazy, but it's unbelievably good. Take a fork before the yolk hardens, pop it, and spread it over the pizza. Scatter those greens and you dig into that and you may never, well, you may never eat eggs any other way and you may never eat pizza any other way. You might just eat this uh, for every meal for like the next two weeks. That's how good it is. So anyway, check out the site, get the ingredients, and uh, as always, enjoy. Potato, feta, red onion, and pesto pizza. And it is delicious. And here we go. We're going to take a sheet pan and dust it well with cornmeal. That gives it that beautiful pizzeria kind of mealy, crusty, crispy bottom. It also prevents it from sticking. So what we're going to do is we're going to take enough pizza to fit a half sheet pan. I'm going to say it's about a pound and a quarter to a pound and a half of dough. All right, you can buy that in the store ready made or make your own. I got recipes on the site. So what I'm going to do is I like it kind of thin. So I'm going to stretch it out. Room temperature dough, much easier to work with. And it's going to be elastic and it will want to move back and run away from you. But just keep stretching and eventually it'll be like, all right, I give up. Make me into a pizza. All right, so the pizza's all stretched out. The pizza dough's all stretched out. We're going to take pesto sauce, a very good high quality pesto sauce from the store. Okay, make sure you read the ingredients. You just want basil and pine nuts and garlic and parmesan and olive oil. No weird stuff. All right, I'm going to roast four or five Yukon Gold potatoes. I want those well done. A lot of places that do a potato pizza, they put the potato on raw, and they cut it really thin and try to cook at the same time the pizza cooks. I don't think it works. I think it's too, I don't know, waxy. So I want those cooked and tender. I'm going to space those around the pizza. I'm going to give it a good dose of black pepper and salt because potatoes are bland, and if you don't season them, you're going to have a flat pizza. And I don't mean, you know, geometrically. I mean flat tasting. You're going to take some good Parmigiano Reggiano, and you're going to kind of grate that Parmesan over the top. Not too much, but make sure there's some in every potato. Now here is where I want you to buy some Fontina. I know you want to use mozzarella, but Fontina is delicious Italian cheese. So grate on some Fontina or mozzarella if you're scared. All right, I'm going to put some thin red onions all over the top. It gives it a great little sharpness and texture. All right, I'm going to do a little dab of extra pesto, just a little couple drips on each potato. I'm going to top that with a barrel-aged feta. And you know if the feta is aged in barrels, it's got to be good. All right, so there you go. We're going to sprinkle that over the top. Our pizza is ready for the oven. We're going to go into a very hot oven. So preheat your oven to 425. 
We're going to put it on the bottom of the oven so it gets nice and crispy. By the way, check it out. I'm cooking in shorts. Hey, Mario Batali, eat your heart out. I'll put my calves up against his any day. All right, so after about 10 minutes on the bottom of the oven, the bottom will be nice and crisp. We're starting to get there. I'm going to move it up to the middle rack for another five minutes. So this cooked about 15, 17 minutes altogether. And just listen to this. The bottom was crisp. Check it with a spatula. If it's not crisp, put it back on the bottom for a few minutes. Nothing worse than doughy, gummy pizza. And that is one delicious pizza. And starch on starch, I know, it's not accepted, but hey, you got to break the rules sometimes. Hope you give that a try. Go check out the story on the site if you're not already there. And as always, enjoy. Chicago Deep Dish Pizza Muffins. That's right. I'm going to show you how to make a Chicago Deep Dish Pizza that you actually can eat by holding it in your hand. You know, like real pizza. Which is why to my friends in Chicago, I will say you're welcome. You can finally put down that fork and knife. Or use it for one of your hot dogs. And yes, it is ironic this is being shared by someone from New York, but this is such a great idea it had to be done. And to get started, let me show you what you're going to need. Besides some of our Chicago-style pizza dough, which of course we have a video for, we will definitely need some cooked crumbled Italian sausage, as well as some diced sweet peppers, which I did give a brief saute to. And then as far as our cheese, I'm going to go with some provolone, which for this technique I prefer to dice up instead of shred. And then we'll also go with some mozzarella, and for that, grating it is fine. And then we'll also be finishing our pizza muffins with Parmesan. But Parmigiano Reggiano is a prima donna and does not show up for dress rehearsals. And then we'll also, of course, need some of your favorite pizza sauce, whether that's our recipe or not. And before we get started, we're going to want to very generously oil a standard muffin tin. And that's it. Once our pan is prepped and our ingredients are ready, we will take some Chicago-style pizza dough that you will make using our critically acclaimed recipe. And for best results, we want this dough to be cold. And while we normally want to use pizza dough that's room temp before we make pizza, for this technique, the cold dough works better, since that's going to prevent it from rising too soon and also make it easier to work with. And what we'll do is roll that out, using just enough flour so it doesn't stick, to a thickness of about an eighth of an inch. And then one big tip here, once we have our dough rolled out, we'll want to go around and loosen the edge, and then we'll pick it up so we're sure it's not stuck to the table. And the reason for that is if it's stuck to the table, that's going to keep the dough from contracting. And then what will happen when we cut out our circles and pick them up? They will basically shrink and they might be too small to use. So by loosening the dough first before we cut it, they are pretty much going to stay four inch circles. Speaking of which, my largest round cutter is slightly smaller than four inches. So I'm actually using the bottom of the tin it came in, which is exactly four inches. And to make one muffin tin of these, we're going to need to cut out 12 pieces which I clearly did not have enough dough to do here. But the good news is we can wad up that dough and just simply cut some more, which is exactly what I did. And then what we'll do is take each circle of dough and we'll place that into each muffin cup and we'll make sure that's centered and nice and flat on the bottom, at which point we'll press it and push it up the sides as best we can. And while we want to get close, we do not need to go all the way to the top. All right, this dough obviously expands when it cooks and you'll see by the time these are done, our dough will have come up all the way to the top and maybe even a little higher. And no, in case you're wondering, I don't feel the need to go in any particular order, which I'm sure definitely bothers some people. All right, you know who you are. And then speaking of contracting dough, like we mentioned earlier, since we are kind of pulling and pushing and stretching this dough up the sides, as the finished ones sit, they will shrink up a little bit. So once we finish the last one, I like to go around one more time, just giving that dough one more push up the sides. And of course, since you're not a robot, and I'm not a robot, allegedly. These are not gonna be all perfectly uniform, but that's okay. As you'll see, once these are filled and baked, they look amazing. And that's it, once our pan has been doughed, we will start filling these in a very precise order. All right, the first thing that goes in is about a tablespoon of our diced provolone. Oh, and the reason I like to dice it is that it's gonna allow for some nooks and crannies into which our sausage and peppers can kind of settle down into. And then once our provolone is set, We'll go ahead and top that with a tablespoon of our cooked crumbled sausage and then a couple teaspoons of our pepper mixture over that. And obviously, any of your favorite pizza ingredients will work in this. I mean, you are after all the Michael Jordan of what these should be sporting. But since the first deep dish pizza I ever had in Chicago was a sausage and pepper, that's what I'm going with here. And it's definitely my favorite version. And as I top these with the peppers, 
I'm sure some of you are getting nervous, since it looks like we're almost all the way to the top, but please relax, it's gonna be fine. Right, these ingredients really settle down once they cook, so even if we're like a half inch to an inch above the top of the pan, it is gonna work out beautifully. But to hedge our bets, let's go ahead and give our fillings a light pressing down before we move on to the final cheese and sauce. And that's it, we'll go ahead and top these with a good rounded tablespoon of mozzarella. And by the way, do not use the nice stuff. And by nice, I mean that fresh, wet stuff, which is incredible in a tomato salad, but it's gonna to be too moist for this. And then what we'll do once our mozzarella has been added is go ahead and spoon over a couple tablespoons of our pizza sauce. And I was just about to say, try not to get any on the dough, but I won't since I just got it on the dough. So I'm not sure you're gonna take me seriously. And also I like to push the first tablespoon down a little bit with the tip of the spoon, basically giving it the old polka polka, just to sort of push it down a little. And then we'll go ahead and put a second spoon over the top. And like I said, it is fine we're going slightly above the level of the pan. In fact, we really do want to for maximum visual appeal when these are done. And then for our final step, we will top these with a very generous grating of real Parmesan cheese. All right, some Parmigiano Reggiano, except no substitutes. And it's okay if a little bit goes on the pan, since there's no way to do this without that happening. So it's okay. And that's it, once that's been very generously grated over, we can go ahead and wipe off a little bit of that excess on the edge of our pan, at which point this is ready to transfer into the center, or upper center, of a 400 degree oven for about 30 to 35 minutes, or until the tops are beautifully browned and they look like this. We should have what looks like 12 perfect, miniaturized, Chicago-style deep dish pizzas. And as you can see, even though our dough didn't come all the way up to the top of the pan, as it baked and expanded, it rose up to the perfect level to produce what I think is a really nice appearance. And then what we'll do is let these cool for about 10 to 15 minutes before we go around the edge with a knife, just in case any of that cheese is stuck. But even if it is, it should separate very easily. And then once that's loose, we can grab a fork or a freakishly small spatula, which I don't have, and we can lift that out. And that's it. A perfect mini deep dish pizza with a beautiful golden crust that's cooked all the way through. And we'll go ahead and transfer those onto a rack to let them cool a little bit more. All right, you can eat these hot, but for me, the ideal service temperature is warm, but they're also incredible at room temp. And if you've been drinking, really good cold. And while those cool, if we want, we can go ahead and sprinkle on a little freshly chopped Italian parsley, which as you might know in the Midwest, counts as a portion of green vegetables. And then even though these are still a little too hot to eat, I'm gonna go for it anyway, because they just look and smell so delicious. And that, my friends, tastes and feels exactly like a deep dish pizza, except I think better, because here it's easier to control the perfect ratio between that buttery cornmeal infused crust and our meaty, cheesy, saucy filling. And even though a little sauce and cheese might char around the edges of some of these, or all of these, that is not a bad thing. That's actually a good thing. And if you're a fan of the Detroit style pizza, you understand why, right? That part is just super extra savory. But anyway, I really did enjoy everything about that. And then I went ahead and plated some up so I could take some contractually obligated pictures and then decide to film myself eating one more. And I'm not sure exactly what it is about Chicago style deep dish pizza, but for whatever reason, sausage and peppers really do work amazingly well. I don't know if it's that little bit of cornmeal in the crust, but for me, that is by far the best combination of ingredients, with ham and pineapple being a close second. All right, I'm just kidding. Oh, and if you're wondering, is there a way we can use this technique for a New York style thin crust pizza? No, there isn't, but we don't need one. Since individually sized New York style pizza is already a thing, and in the pizza business, we call that a slice. And if you're thinking about making these for a party, you can make these ahead and then just put them on a sheet pan and pop them in a hot oven until they're heated through and they're gonna be great. But whether you reheat these or eat them right away, or you use different fillings or make them as shown, I really do hope you give these a try soon. So please follow the links below for the ingredient amounts, a printable written recipe and much more info as usual. And as always, enjoy. How to make a calzone. That's right, we're finally gonna do calzone one of the most requested recipes we haven't gotten to yet. And before we get started, I probably should mention I'm more of a pizza guy, so I've actually only made calzone a handful of times, 
But despite that, I do consider myself somewhat of an expert because I'm on the internet. So I am looking forward to passing along all my expertise for what really is a shockingly simple recipe. So let's go ahead and get started. And first up, a little tip about mozzarella cheese. If you are using fresh mozzarella, which I highly recommend, what we're going to want to do is slice it nice and thin and put it on a paper towel to kind of wick away that excess moisture. And by the way, if you're using the mozzarella from the supermarket that looks and feels like a white rubber ball, you don't have to do this. So that's good, I guess. And you know what? I just realized I got a little too much here. That's better. And once that's set, we can move on to the dough. So for one single calzone, you're going to need six ounces of pizza dough, which is exactly one quarter of our Wolfgang Puck-inspired pizza dough recipe, which is the one I'm recommending here. And I'll tell you why in the blog. So we'll put that down on a well-floured surface, and we'll sprinkle a little more over the top. And as usual, we only want to use enough flour so the dough doesn't stick. So if it does seem like you've put too much down, like it did to me here, brush some away. And then all we're going to do is flatten that dough out into some sort of round shape. And at that point, I'm going to switch to a rolling pin and roll this out to about 8 or 9 inches wide. And I do like the rolling pin for this. But if you are an accomplished pizza dough stretcher or spinner, go ahead and do your thing. Hopefully we're all going to get to the same place, which like I said is about an 8 or 9 inch round piece of dough about an eighth of an inch thick. And unlike if we were making pizza, we really don't want the dough on the edges any thicker than the dough on the inside. So what I like to do when I have the right size, I'll take my rolling pin and just kind of go around flattening out those edges just a little bit. And hopefully that will make sense when you see how we fold this up. And then once our dough has been prepped, we'll start laying down our ingredients. And we're going to start with the first of two kinds of hams. I'm going to lay down a couple slices of prosciutto. You can use prosciutto, which is the same thing. And we're just going to lay our fillings down on half the dough, being sure to leave about an inch of plain dough around the edge. So we'll lay down a couple slices of prosciutto, followed by the first of two cheeses, which would be some ragat, also referred to more commonly as ricotta. And don't be stingy here. This is the main ingredient. And by the way, because I'm kind of fancy, I'm using an incredibly delicious local sheep's milk ricotta which is just amazing. And by the way, that's a good tip because there's only a few ingredients in this we're going to want to use the highest quality possible. So we will spoon down our ricotta. And then before we add the other ham and the other cheese, what we'll do is we'll season this up a little bit with some freshly ground black pepper and then a little B of C. And if you're new around here, that just means a little bit of cayenne. And then once that's been seasoned, we will top our ricotta with the second type of ham, which is just plain old regular ham that I diced up. So really, any kind of smoked deli-style ham will work here. So we'll place over some ham. Again, being careful, we have a border of plain dough going around the edge. And then once the ham is placed down, we can finish this off with our mozzarella, which should be nicely drained by now. And that is going to be it for the filling. And what we have here is my take on a very traditional calzone, but it should be painfully obvious you could stuff this with whatever you want. You are the Al Capone of your calzone. Sometimes I have to add a syllable for those to work. And even then. But anyway, no matter what you fill this with, once you're done, this is how we're going to fold it up. So the first thing I think we should do is take a damp fingertip. I'm just dipping it into a little water. And I do like to go around and kind of moisten the edge of that dough. Because depending on how long it took you to fill this, the surface of that dough may have dried out a little bit. And we want to make sure those two layers of dough stick really well together. So by dabbing that with a tiny bit of water, we're going to make it a little bit sticky, which will help it seal. And then once that's been accomplished, we will grab our dough and fold that over the top, kind of stretching it just past our filling just to where our plain border of dough starts. And we'll kind of tap that down with our fingers just to keep it in place. And then what we'll do, and this is what really seals this together, we'll take that extra dough, we'll start folding it over, going around, kind of crimping it like this. And because we did leave ourselves with enough plain dough, by the time we worked our way from one end to the other, we should have a very strong and secure seal. And by the way, don't worry about any kind of design around the edge. No matter how you've done it, it's going to look amazing once it bakes. So that should help you relax a little bit. And at this point, we can transfer that onto our baking sheet. But before we do, I want to sprinkle down a little cornmeal. That's going to help keep this from sticking, as well as provide some textural interest to the bottom crust. So we'll do a little bit of cornmeal, which brings us to the most terrifying part of the whole procedure, transferring this onto the pan. Because you're going to be afraid it's going to fall apart, but it won't. Assuming that this is not stuck to the table, so you should probably check for that. But assuming it's not stuck, we're just going to grab that with both hands confidently, and quickly transfer it onto our sheet pan. And I said confidently, do not hesitate. A calzone can sense fear. And once that's been successfully transferred to our pan, we're going to need to take the tip of a knife and make some air vents, especially if you're using a fresh mozzarella like we did, because there's going to be a lot of moisture in there, which means a lot of steam. And if that doesn't vent up through these holes at the top, who knows where that's going to come out? 
but you can be sure it won't be in a good spot. So I'm going to make three holes on the top like you see here. And then once our holes are made, we'll go ahead and paint this with a little bit of an egg wash, which is just one whole egg beaten with a couple teaspoons of water. And we'll brush that over. And then last but not least, a very light dusting of Parmesan cheese. And as I mentioned earlier, we're only going to use the best ingredients for this. So we will be going with the Parmigiano Reggiano. And we don't want too much here, just a light dusting, which is going to add a little bit of flavor, but more importantly, an amazingly beautiful golden brown color. And at this point, our calzone is ready for the oven. But let me give you one quick tip first, which hopefully will help prevent your smoke alarm from going off. Because our oven's at 500, sometimes that excess cornmeal and possibly Parmesan on the pan will burn. So what I like to do is take a second and just sort of brush off that excess with a paper towel. And I know some of you are thinking, hey, I took the batteries out of my smoke alarm in the kitchen a long time ago. But that is incredibly dangerous and not recommended. So do this instead. And at this point, we can go ahead and transfer that into the center of a 500 degree oven for about 15 minutes or until it's beautifully browned and looks something like this. If everything's gone according to plan, this should be visually stunning. And then let me burn myself a little bit here so you can see how beautifully that bottom browned. Oh yeah. And by the way, you're always gonna get a little bit of juice that comes up through the holes at the top and then burns onto the bottom of the pan, which reminds me, do yourself a favor and put some parchment paper down on the pan first. I mean, I'm not looking forward to cleaning that. Or at least I'm not looking forward to telling an intern they have to wash that. And then here's the deal. If you want to eat this right away, you can, but you're going to need a fork and a knife. But personally, I like to cut this in half and eat it with my hands, which in that case, we're going to want to let this rest at least 10 minutes. And of course, the international symbol for this pan is hot is a towel placed on the corner. Make sure you practice that and teach everyone in your household that, especially the kids. But anyway, I did let mine cool about 10 minutes, and then I served it up. And because I ordered the lunch special, mine came with a small side salad, as well as a little spicy marinara for dipping. I will assume that's not traditional. And that's it. I believe we've successfully navigated the highway to the Calzone Zone. I would like to at this time apologize to Kenny Loggins and his entire family. But anyway, that looks too good not to dig into. And like I said when we took this out of the oven, if you want to serve this right away, you can. But that molten hot filling is going to be very, very runny. So I do like to let mine cool a little so I can use a bare hand delivery system. So let's split that in half and take a look. That filling's still nice and hot, but not runny. And we have that gorgeous creamy cheesiness from our sheep's milk ricotta, which you really should try to find. And then not one, but two kinds of ham. And you could do it with just one or the other, but I really do find this much more interesting if you use both. And while I do like to eat mine by hand, there is no shame in your game if you use a fork. I mean, this is not like pizza. You use a fork for pizza, you should be put in jail. But anyway, that's it, my take on the old calzone, which I believe in Italian means hot pocket. I could be wrong, but I think that's what it is. So like I said, we'd had a ton of requests for this recipe, and I just hadn't gotten around to filming it, but hopefully it was worth the wait. So I really do hope you give this a try. Head over to foodwishes.com for all the ingredient amounts and more info as usual. And as always, enjoy. Pizza Dia. That's right, I'm watching TV the other day, and I see a commercial for something called a papadilla. And at first I thought, wow, they finally developed the technology for folding a pizza in half. And then I thought, hey, that's not a bad idea, except you have to bake a pizza first. And then I thought, or do you? And what follows is my attempt to make one of these things, just using a pan. And not to spoil the ending, but this totally worked. So with that, let's go ahead and get started by buying or making some pizza dough. And what I have here is one batch of our famous Wolfgang Puck's pizza dough that I've divided into four portions. And what we'll do using just enough flour so it doesn't stick is roll this out into a circle just about an eighth of an inch thick. And one great tip for rolling out pizza dough, because it tends to be fairly elastic, while you're doing this, if it won't stay rolled out and it keeps stretching back, just stop rolling for a minute and let the dough relax, and then continue on. And you'll see that should make things a lot easier. Oh, and the other tip is, while we don't want a ton of flour worked into this, we do want to make sure we have enough under the dough so it doesn't stick onto the table once we have this rolled all the way out. And as you can see, I just like to sort of drag it across that sprinkled flour on the table so as to pick up just the right amount. But anyway, one way or another, we'll go ahead and roll that out nice and thin. Oh, and please be aware when you pick this up to put it in the pan, it's always going to stretch out a little more, so I will generally roll it out about an inch or so less than the size of my pan. Okay, so my dough is looking good. And at this point, we can head to the stove to prep our pan, which means getting it nice and hot over medium-high heat. 
and we'll also give that a fairly generous brushing of olive oil. And you'll probably notice some little wisps of smoke coming up as I do this. That's fine since it means it's hot enough. But as soon as we place our dough in, we will immediately turn our heat down to medium. And I will tell you why in a moment. And as soon as that dough hits the hot pan, you're going to notice lots of little bubbles forming. Which is great news. Because not only does that mean our pizza di crust is going to be nice and airy and light, but also once we flip those over, those bubbles are going to kind of brown and char. And they're going to give this thing a very beautiful and highly enticing appearance. So eventually this bubbled side is going to be the outside of our pizza dia. And that's because after cooking this for about two minutes, we're going to go ahead and flip it over, revealing what we'll call the smooth side. Yes, yeah, smooth except for those giant bubbles. But that's fine because as we spread over our pizza sauce, which is the next step, we'll go ahead and press any of those down. And as we do that, not only will this smooth side become actually smooth, it will also become covered with sauce. And then what we'll do once that's been administered is go ahead and transfer on the toppings of our choice, which for me is going to be some mozzarella cheese, some sweet Italian sausage, some mushrooms, and some red onions. And just like when we make regular pizza, we don't want to overdo it with the toppings. So please show a little bit of restraint, otherwise the proportions are going to be all off. And instead of a pizza dia, you could accidentally end up with a pizza rito, which actually doesn't sound bad, but that's another video. But anyway, having said that, of course, how much is up to you? I mean, you are after all the Papa John of how much to put on. But no matter how much you use, we'll probably want to leave about a half inch to an inch of dough around the outside, around the outside, around the outside. So when we fold this, it doesn't all squish out. And speaking of folding, for best results, the non-cheese ingredients should be placed just on one half. Oh, and the reason we turned our heat down to medium is because it's going to take a few minutes to get these toppings on. And we don't want that crust underneath charring too much by the time all our fixings have been placed down. But anyway, once that's been successfully topped, we'll go ahead and take a spatula and we'll make a crease by pressing gently into the dough exactly in the middle or as close as we can get, at which point we will carefully fold this over and then we'll evaluate. Okay, if it's beautifully brown and as crispy as we want, we can go ahead and serve it. But if we want this to grill a little more, which I do, we'll go ahead and brush that very lightly with olive oil. All right, not too much, just a light coating. And then we can go ahead and flip that over. Always, by the way, turning towards the seam side. Otherwise, we could have some molten pizza fillings falling out due to the physics of a flimsier fulcrum. And then while that side is getting a little browner, we'll go ahead and brush a little more olive oil on this side. And we will simply continue grilling this, flipping it from side to side as we see fit until it's exactly as browned as we want. And because our dough was so thin, by the time it looks like this, it's going to be fully cooked through. And that's it. We'll go ahead and remove that from the pan and plate up. And we will cut that in half using a pizza dia wheel. And if you don't have one, just use a regular pizza wheel. And then because I have to take pictures of this, I went ahead and served a little salad alongside. And since that was only lettuce and oil and vinegar, I decided to grate over a little bit of Parmigiano Reggiano, which always makes it better. Or as a James Beard Award winner would say, elevates it. And that's it. After taking a few pictures, I grabbed a half and dug in. And I absolutely loved what I'd produced. Okay, it really did have the taste and texture of a folded over slice of pizza. Which reminds me, I could have made this look a lot more visually impressive by doubling the toppings. But I really did want to stick with the same proportions that you'd get on a pizza. And while it might not be that easy to see, especially since I keep holding this out of the frame, there really was plenty of that stuff to go around. So I'm officially designating this experiment a great success, and not just because it was a very delicious thing to eat. What this relatively fast and easy procedure allows you to do is make a single portion of what's very, very close to pizza in a pan on top of the stove in just a few minutes without ever having to turn on the oven. And by the way, if you do a search for pizza dia, you don't really see this. Right? What you see instead is an actual quesadilla made with flour tortillas, which is then topped with sauce and cheese and whatever to make a pizza which I'm sure is lovely, but that's actually a quesadilla pizza and not a true pizzadilla like this. And of course, if you'd like to argue about that, I'm on Twitter. But in the meantime, let me just finish by saying, I really do hope you give this a try soon. So please follow the links below for the ingredient amounts, a printable written recipe and much more info as usual. And as always, enjoy. Grilled pineapple and prosciutto flatbread. 
That's right, as you may know, pairing pineapple with ham on a pizza is very controversial. But what's not controversial, and actually a proven scientific fact, is that sweet pineapple pairs perfectly with the salty savoriness of ham. And since there's no sauce or cheese involved, and we're not calling this pizza, I think this is a wonderful way for you to enjoy this pairing without having to worry about an angry mob of food bloggers with torches and pitchforks surrounding your house. And to get started, let me show you a very simple, almost no need method for doing our flatbread dough. And that begins with equal parts of warm water and all-purpose flour, plus one teaspoon of active dry yeast. And then what we'll do is work this over with a whisk for about 30 seconds, or until we have a nice smooth lump-free batter. And by the way, remember not too long ago when there was a big yeast shortage? If God forbid that ever happens again, we don't always have to use the entire package of yeast, especially for a simple flatbread dough like this. So just something to keep in mind when times get tough. And then once mixed, what we'll do is cover this with a towel, and we will let this sit for 30 minutes to give our yeast a nice head start before we uncover it and add the rest of the ingredients, which there are hardly any since this is a very, very simple basic dough. So we'll let that sit for a half hour, after which it's not going to look a lot different. Although if you look closely, you will see thousands of little tiny bubbles forming. And then to finish this, we'll add a little bit of olive oil. And if you can, when you pour it in, try to form some kind of interesting looking design. And then we definitely also need a little bit of salt, as well as the rest of our flour. At which point I'm going to grab a spoon and start stirring this. And I'm going to keep stirring it until it forms what we call in the business a shaggy dough. And yes, in case you're wondering, I do often use a fork for this, or sometimes a wooden spoon, or sometimes I just get right in there with my hand. But anyway, the point is it really doesn't matter. As long as we're able to mix this all together, we're going to be fine. And then once our dough gets to this point, we will go ahead and transfer everything to our work surface, where we're going to give it a very brief kneading with our hand, or hands if you're ambidextrous. And of course, as we do this, we'll want to pick up any of those loose particles from the counter, which reminds me, this is going to be a fairly soft and sticky dough, although you're not really going to notice that stickiness too much, thanks to that tablespoon of olive oil we put in. Okay, that's pretty much going to prevent it from sticking to our hands or the table. Not to mention, it also makes the dough feel really, really good and fun to work with. In fact, this feels so supple and luxurious. It's a shame we're only going to need it for like two minutes. But that is all we need, pun intended. And the reason for the brief kneading is because what we'll do is transfer this into a zip top bag, into which we drizzled a couple teaspoons of olive oil. And after making sure that dough is coated, and we pressed out most of the air and sealed it up, we're going to pop this in the fridge overnight, which is going to allow for a very slow and gentle rise. And besides kneading, gluten, which is the protein in the flour, will also develop and form over time, which long story short is why no-knead bread recipes work so well. So we'll go ahead and pop that in the fridge overnight, and then the next day we can pull it out, and it's probably going to look something like this. And if you're thinking, that sounds great, but I want it today. Well, no problem. You can just knead that dough for like five or six minutes until it's nice and elastic, and then let it rise covered in a warm spot until it's doubled in size. But anyway, if we're using the overnight method, what we'll want to do is let this cold dough warm up on the counter for about 45 minutes or so. And while that's happening, let's go ahead and prep our pineapple. And to start that, we'll go ahead and cut off the top. And then I'm going to cut this in half. Since that's all I'm going to grill, and I'll save the other half for something else, Possibly a banana split ice cream cake, but I cannot confirm that at this point. And then what we'll do is cut around like this, slicing off that skin, which unfortunately is still going to leave us with those little tough dark eyes here and there, which are kind of tough, and we really do want to remove. And I generally just do that with the tip of the knife, just sort of cutting around and digging them out the best I can. And yes, if you're super lazy, you can just cut more of the skin off, and you won't have as many of those to trim out, but you're going to lose a lot of sweet, delicious pineapple. And I should mention there are a lot of methods for doing this, where you cut these diagonal channels to get all those at once, but I've never really found one method to be superior to the other. So I just go with the old search and destroy technique. And after a couple minutes, those were all gone. At which point we're going to want to quarter this, and then trim out that tough fibrous core in the center. And the grilling method I like would be to grill these quarters whole and get some nice browning and charring on the surface, after which I'll slice them thin and place that on my flatbread. But if you wanted, you can slice this up first and then grill the individual pieces. Or rings if you want to cut it that way. But to me, grilling these quarter pieces whole works out the best. And that's it. Once those are set, we'll head out to the grill, where I have some beautiful hot white ashy coals. And we'll transfer those on with the rounded side down. Although it probably doesn't matter. 
and we will grill these for about three or four minutes per side or until it's hot all the way through and we have some very nice charring. And that rounded, much juicier side with all the holes is not going to char up as easily, but that's okay. We'll just give that side about three minutes or so, and then we'll flip it over to the flatter side, the side that we cut out the core. And that side usually chars up a lot easier and a lot more uniformly. And if everything goes according to plan, this is exactly what we want it to look like. And by the way, two of these should be plenty for the four flatbreads this recipe makes, but I want to grill up the other two, since I have it on a very reliable source that this stuff is really good on vanilla ice cream. And that's it, we'll simply set those aside until needed. And by now our dough should have warmed up and continued to rise even more. And what we'll do is remove the dough from the bag and place it on our work surface, at which point we're going to divide this into four portions. And yes, if I had formed this into a ball first, it would have been easier to cut into four equal portions. But that's okay. I am not overly concerned with getting these perfectly even. What is much more important is after we cut these and we roll them into a nice little ball of dough, is that we roll them out into a nice uniform thickness, which is ideally going to be about an eighth of an inch. So no matter what size your portion, or whether you go with an oval or a round or a rectangle, the only critical thing is that we roll these out nice and thin, which as you can see I've done pretty successfully here. And I'm only doing one at this point for filming purposes, but once we have our flatbread dough rolled out, we will head out to the grill. And because our dough is so thin, I find flopping it on top of my hand a very safe and easy way to handle this without tearing it. And we'll go out and we'll place this over those very same coals. And that's it, we're simply going to grill this for about two minutes per side. And while that first side's grilling, you're definitely going to see some bubbles forming, or at least I hope you do, since that means our dough was wet enough, and we're going to end up with a beautiful, light, bubbly, chewy texture. So we'll give that first side a couple minutes and then flip it over. And because you're always going to have hot spots on a grill, especially using charcoal, which really, if possible, should be the only thing you use, we're probably going to have to move this around in order to get some nice, even charring. All right, so don't be afraid to observe and adjust and reposition as you see fit. And if you want to flip that back over a time or two, go ahead. That is just you cooking. And as you may have heard me say before, the food gods hate a coward. So don't be afraid to burn this and take it off too early. Okay, that stuff you see that looks like smoke is probably actually steam coming from the inside of the flatbread. And to me, this is not done properly unless about 50% of the surface area is nicely charred, which is pretty much where I was at right here. So we'll go ahead and pull that off and head back inside. And we will move into final production. And the first thing we'll do is drizzle this warm flatbread with a nice drizzle of olive oil, followed by laying over our thinly sliced prosciutto. And in the spirit of full disclosure, I am not using the authentic Parma ham, but rather a very nice and very affordable one from Iowa, which really did work out quite nicely. And almost literally, any salty cured ham will work. And then once we've placed over whatever we think is the perfect amount of that, we will take our beautiful fire-roasted pineapple tenderloin and we'll cut nice thin slices and place that over the top. And as I mentioned earlier, if you want even more grill marks, you can try to grill individual slices of the pineapple, which will work. It just takes a little more effort. But with the charring we have on the outside of this pineapple, combined with the char marks on our flatbread, I think we're going to have the perfect amount of char-grilled smokiness. And that's it, once our grilled flatbread has been fruited, I'm gonna scatter over some fresh herb leaves in the form of sweet, fragrant tarragon. But of course, use the herb of your choice. Okay, some thyme leaves would be beautiful. Or if you're really careful and just use a little bit, some fresh rosemary or chives. And then I'm gonna finish mine up with some freshly ground black pepper, as well as one more light drizzle of olive oil. And then last but not least, an optional ingredient that I would consider mandatory and that would be a nice big pinch of flaky sea salt, which is really going to help bring out the sweetness in that pineapple. And that's it. While this thing is still warm, I'm going to go ahead and plate up. And I'll take my pizza wheel and cut it in half. Which, no, does not mean this suddenly becomes a pineapple ham pizza. Take it easy, food bloggers. But no matter what you call this, I'm pretty sure you will agree. This is going to be one of the most delicious things that comes off your grill this summer. Or fall, or winter, or spring. All right, let's not limit ourselves. And the combination of our partially charred flatbread with that salty, savory ham, pairing perfectly with that sweet, juicy pineapple, really is extraordinary. 
Oh, and if you're not into pineapple, this would also be fantastic with grilled peaches or grilled figs or even things like apples or pears. So if you want to switch it up, go ahead. I mean, you are, after all, the Dwight Schrute of your meat and fruit. And as long as what you're grilling is fairly sweet, it should work perfectly here. Yes, including probably grilled beets, although I've never tried that. But whether you make this as shown with the pineapple or you switch the fruit to suit your taste, either way, I really do hope you give this a try soon. So please follow the links below for the ingredient amounts, a printable written recipe, and much more info as usual. And as always, enjoy.